Grace and peace be yours in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 First Corinthians chapter 10. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses. What's he talking about? Red Sea, right? He's talking about the children of Israel who have been enslaved in Egypt. God, by his mighty power, has delivered them from that slavery. Let me ask you this. Israel are slaves. Egypt is the world's most powerful nation. What chance do the Jews have of freeing themselves on their own? None. So if they could free themselves, how did they get free? God, right? That's as clear as it's going to be. One of my Sam Crofts used to say that the Exodus is God's most powerful act of salvation in the Old Testament. And it is. And God takes them out of slavery and they go through the Red Sea. And this phrase that probably kind of catches us off guard, it says they were baptized into Moses. Uh, that's a funny phrase. I want us to hold on to that but so we all know where we are, right? Children of Israel uh, fleeing from Egypt, rescued by God. They're baptized into Moses. And the next verse says this, and they all ate the same spiritual food. Now, what food? The manna, right? Everybody's got that. So they went through the Red Sea, and they ate the manna in the desert. Now, here's what I want us to catch. Why is Paul talking about this? Old Testament events that prefigure what God is going to do. God is doing that, right? God is at work to deliver them from slavery in Egypt, but God is prefiguring what he will do. So it says they were baptized, they go through the river, and then having gone through the river, they also ate the same food. What is that prefiguring? Why is pastor standing in the middle of the aisle? Here's why. <laughs> They're prefiguring that you were baptized, right? Now, it's funny, the Old Testament as I said, prefigures. It's never exactly the same, right? It always changes a little bit. But the Old Testament sort of hints at what God will do. But in the New Testament, he does something a little bit different. So we don't say, this morning we had two baptisms. I didn't baptize uh, the boys into Moses, right? I baptized them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a New Testament thing. But we are baptized. Who here is baptized? Pretty much everybody, right? If you're not baptized... Give me a call. We do baptisms here, right? Uh, you should be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, having our sins washed away and properly claimed. Now, uh, after baptism, what else do we do? Communion. It says they ate the spiritual food. What are we going to do? We're going to eat the spiritual food. The body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. Now, here's the thing I always love to ask about baptism and communion. Did Pastor and Walt come up with the idea of, of baptism and communion? No, I didn't. Did our board of elders come up with that? Where did we get it? It's in the Bible, right? Jesus said, go and make disciples doing what? Amen. Baptizing and teaching, right? Make disciples, baptizing and teaching. That's we're still doing that. Baptizing and teaching. And then Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, do this. Now, here's what I want to get uh, that's our practice, right? Baptism and communion. It's a scriptural practice. It's a spiritual practice where God has said, I'm going to give you my grace and forgiveness. And then he gives it a location where it takes place. But again, I'm standing here to emphasize something, to say if you were to walk into church and you come down the center aisle, what's the first thing you come to? The font. And if you were to proceed past the font, what's the next thing you come to? The altar. So here's what I want to mention. Is I want you to notice this. Baptism and communion are scriptural practices that are where God pours his grace out into us. But I want us to get this. It's not just our practice. It's our architecture. You see what I'm saying? And I want you to notice that. It's our practice, but it's our architecture. So every time you come into church, what do I want you to do? I want you to look at the font. And I want you to look past the font and look at the altar. Where are they? Front and center, right? Front and center. They trump everything else we do. They trump preaching, actually, right? All the preaching is important. The pastor thinks preaching is important. I just want you to know that. Uh, but this is front and center. Some churches have the baptismal font at the back of the church, and they're saying that the baptismal font is the way you get into the church. 
I, mean, I like it up here because it's easier to see, right? So we can see what's going on. Uh, if you have a baptism at the back, everybody has to turn their neck around like what's going on back there. So we have that there. Now, having said that, that's a wonderful thing. God is gracious and merciful. That's 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4. But the next thing that happens is verse 5. And I hope everybody caught the message because the next thing that goes is the wonderful promises of God in the sacraments. And we esteem the sacraments, make use of the sacraments. But the next thing that happens is a warning. He says that God delivered Israel through the washing and through the feeding. But the next verse says, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. They were overthrown in the wilderness. How many of the Israelites went through the Red Sea? All of them. Some of them weren't believers. Right? Most attached it. That's what he's saying. Some people have made use of the sacraments and just gone through the motion. That's what he's saying. That the church is not about stand here, sit there, now you've done it. That's what it's not about. There's a way to do them in a pro forma way to not make use of them, not to not receive them rightly. Right? So he says, guys, be aware of this. And then he says the same word twice, verse 6 and verse 11. St. Paul talked about Israel's histories. says this happened to them as an example for us. That's the word example. That means we are supposed to look at the Old Testament, see that God is a God of grace and mercy, but also be warned about the mistakes that they had made. Does that make sense? Now, what mistakes have they made? And he lists several, and he's going to give them right in a row. Verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10. Here they are. Verse 7. Don't be idolaters as some of them were. What is an idolater? An idolater is someone who gives the glory that belongs to God to something else other than the real God. Now, in modern America, you're going to hear this on a regular basis. It's a modern American spiritual thing. We always are going, all gods are the same. I want you to know that it's unbiblical. Some people say, you can call God by any name you want. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says, this God. Don't be idolaters like some of them were. The next thing he says, verse 8, don't indulge in sexual immorality. We've talked about that in some previous weeks. Again, you live in a culture that sort of says to you, the biblical sexual ethic is really outdated and old-fashioned. We know better now. The modern sexual ethic is as long as you have two consenting adults, it's all right. That's unbiblical. He says, don't make phony use of the sacraments and then live like the rest of the world does. Does that make sense? Verse 9, don't put Christ to the test. Don't constantly doubt and undermine and speak against, that kind of stuff. Don't put Christ to the test. I always love it. Jesus was tempted by the devil. The devil said to him, jump off the temple and the angels will bear you off. What did Jesus say? We don't do silly stuff like that to test the Lord. Right? And then the, verse 10, this is the toughie. Are you ready? Are you ready for the toughie? Verse 10, don't grumble. <laughs> Whoops. Now here's the deal. Many of us have passed the other test and say, no, we're good on that. I sometimes want to say my spiritual gift is grumbling. <laughs> right? Grumbling is easy. He says, don't grumble. Don't grumble and murmur against the Lord. In fact, the Old Testament lesson was exactly that. Israel, once again, Moses, did you bring us out here to die? And Moses says, why are you grumbling against me? Right, that whole passage. He says, don't grumble. It, it's a short circuit. A short circuit, our spiritual life, to live in that kind of grumbling life that we do. So he says, don't do those things. Summation, verse 12, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And I know there's some Christians out there that say, once saved, always saved. They'll say, you can never fall. And why is verse 12 in the Bible? I'm not saying we should live afraid of it. I'm just saying that it is possible. We live in the present time at all times, right? God didn't say, even like this morning, he didn't say, be baptized and disappear, right? You raise these kids in the Lord, right? You raise them in the fear of the Lord. We raise ourselves in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Why? Don't fall, right? Don't fall. That's what I'm saying. Now, that, those are tough words. Here's something. I want us to notice verse 13. And this is going to be what we look at uh, to wind out the sermon this morning. Um, and several things he says. Verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. I love those words. Why does he say no temptation has overtaken you that's, that's not what? Not common. Why does he say that? Here's the thing that happens to us. 
Whenever we go through something difficult in life, the next thing that happens is we will feel alone, right? And we'll feel like it's me against the world or I'm in this by myself. And especially among the younger folks, but all of us can do it sometimes, a lot of times people think, I'm going through something that nobody else has ever gone through before, right? Is that ever possible? It's not. Whatever you're going through, somebody else has gone through it. And that's why in church we say that we need to share our burdens with each other because sometimes you say, here's this challenge that I have in my life. And somebody else will often say, my family's been through that. Let's talk, right? That's a promise from the Lord. So the first thing, nothing uncommon is happening to you. Second phrase, God is faithful. God is faithful. The Bible is full of God's promises, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his love for you, his constant presence, his support. It's in the Bible all over the place. Read those verses and then hold on to them. God is faithful. What are you going through? God is faithful nonetheless. Next phrase, he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. I hear people say that a lot. God will uh, put us through anything that we can't bear up under. And you know what? That's actually in the Bible. Right? It's in the Bible. It's not just a thing that we say amongst ourselves. Now, if, you, if you've ever gone through stuff, you'll think what I've thought. Every once in a while, you'll say, I know God won't let me be tempted beyond what I can bear, but I sometimes want to pray, God, you think I can bear more than I think I can bear. Right? We see it and we say, Lord, this is too much. And I want you to know the promise of the Lord is, no, it's not. No, it's not. And this phrase, <coughs> With the temptation, you also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, here's what he's saying. A lot of times, something happens to us, and we describe the events that have gone on in our life, and sometimes we'll say, well, I had to do this. Ever do that? I had to do this. The Bible is often saying that we're letting ourselves off the hook. It's not so much I had to, but very often I could have done this or that. And we don't always look for the escape route that God gives. He says, I know there's the temptation, there's the difficulty, but God has said, I've created something else to put into its place. Substitute this for that. Does that make sense? Instead of saying, I did this because I had to, no, look for the other door. God is going to create a door number two. And take that door. Does that make sense? Okay. So here we are. The baptized communion people of God, he wants us to live a godly life, and he also knows that things are going to come into our life, and here's what he's saying. Don't be like Israel, who did this, 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 and this. Right? Don't do that. But know that what you're going through is shared among all people. And in this, he wants us to make use of the font and the altar. Now here's, not all, but some people come to church and say, Pastor, I'm unworthy to commune. Are you ready for the theological answer to that? <laughs> You're right, you are unworthy to commune. I am unworthy to commune. <coughs> it had nothing to do with our worthiness, did it? No. What did it have to do with? No. The word and promise of God. What is the word and promise of God? In these things I will give you my grace and forgiveness. So here's the deal. If you're here and you think, I'm unworthy, that might actually be a spiritual insight, right? Here's what he's saying. Then come, right? Come. They went through the Red Sea once. You only do this once. They ate the manna every day. So I don't know they commune every day, but they commune regularly. So walk in the center aisle, and you look ahead. It's our practice. It's our architecture that God washes and feeds his people and says, come. Amen. And we stand together. And the peace of God has to help human understanding. Uh, grant, you, grant you God's peace in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.